So welcome everyone. I'm uh, Rafael Carmona from the ICDR. And on behalf of uh, ICDR Young and International or YNI, I want to uh, welcome you all and thank you very much for joining us today. I want to thank also our great lineup of speakers and especially I want to thank uh, Patricia Shaughnessy and Greta Walters who have been the leading force behind organizing this webinar. And uh, before we commence, I want to make a number of announcements. First, a quick reminder that you can sign up as a YNI associate if you go to our website. If you look at uh, ICDR Young and International, you'll find it and you'll be able to complete a registration form. We have them in Spanish and in English. And in that website, you'll also be able to check our past webinars that we have recorded and uploaded there. Uh, but if uh, you don't want to complete that the form, you can also just join our LinkedIn group. If you look us up in LinkedIn, uh, ICDR Young and International, just ICDR Young, it will already pop up and you can request to join. We will accept you. And we're also going to be posting all of our updates there, as well as some other initiatives that you might find interesting. And since I, guess that uh, a lot of our audience might also be interested in this. I want to mention that we have a, uh, upcoming our ICDR practice mood and lecture series. It will take place uh, the 19th of February, 2021. We will open registrations at the beginning of December. We will uh, open it in our website. I, if you look for ICDR practice mood, you'll also find that. And uh, this year is also going to be virtual, uh, just like the Vismood itself. So uh, without uh, further ado, I will very quickly introduce our panelists. Our first uh, panel is going to be on Joinder and it's going to be moderated by Patricia Shaughnessy uh, from Stockholm University in Stockholm. And uh, it's, uh, the speakers are going to be Dr. Christopher Book from Schellenberg Bittmer in Zurich, uh, Sherlyn Tung from Withers in Hong Kong and Louis Kimmelman from Sydney Austin, New York. Uh, for the panel on virtual hearings, we are going to have Greta Walters from Chaffet Lindsay in New York as our moderator. And the speakers are going to be James Hosking, also from Chaffet Lindsay, New York, uh, Fatima Balfaqui from RKAH Consultancy, Abu Dhabi, and Rodrigo de Oliveira Franco from Guandalini Sfer and Oliveira Franco Advogados in Sao Paulo. So, as you can see, we have a very uh, international uh, group of speakers. And with that, I think I will leave the floor to Patricia to begin with the first panel. Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rafael. And thank you to all of the hundreds of you who are taking time to join us on this panel today. And we welcome all of you to post any questions in the Q&A and we'll try to get through to the questions. We have a super lineup with a great deal of expertise, as you know. And I um, just want to make a couple of quick uh, comments regarding the topics. There are so many things to discuss on Joinder, and we have panelists who bring rich experience from different perspectives and different regions, as well as different roles as arbitrator, counsel, institutional, et cetera. Um, but the one thing that we should keep in mind is that one must make a distinction between the administrative decision to join parties and the jurisdictional decision of whether or not the party that is sought to be joined has a arbitration agreement, which applies in the case at hand. So let's keep that distinction in mind and we may come back into that. And the other thing that we might want to keep in mind as we look at some of the different approaches and such is that one of the big distinctions in the rules are whether it is the institution that makes the joinder decision typically before the case has gone to the tribunal or if it is the tribunal that makes a joinder decision um, as maybe discussed the new ICC revisions going into effect in January they've had an institutional decision making procedure but they're opening up for an exceptional case as the tribunal could that's going to make a difference in practice so the main thing that all of you should do is read your rules carefully. Look at the practice. Having said that, I'm going to turn it right over to Dr. Christopher Boog, who is probably the most experienced person on the Swiss rules approach to Joinder and where they may be going in its practice. So, 
Thank you very much, uh, Patricia, and thank you also, Greta, for the very kind uh, invitation to speak today. And thanks, of course, also to uh, ICDRY. And I, I remember very fondly the times when I was a wee bit younger, so I was not only I, but Y and I, and attended many Y and I events in New York and elsewhere. Um, as Patricia said, I've been asked to say a few words um, on the Swiss rules, which are obviously very interesting in general, but of even more interest. Uh, this year, given the Bismuth problem. The Swiss rules deal with joinder in, uh, as many of you will know, Article 4.2, and I think it's worth uh, reading out that provision to you. It reads as follows, where one or more third persons request to participate in arbitral proceedings already pending under these rules, or where a party to the pending arbitral proceedings under these rules requests, that one or more third persons participate in the arbitration, the arbitral tribunal shall decide on such request after consulting with all of the parties, including the person or persons to be joined, taking into account all relevant circumstances. Now, I think the first remarkable thing about the Swiss rules that it took me about 30 seconds uh, to read out that quote. That would be very different um, if I tried to read out joinder provisions um, from other arbitral rules who will probably be here uh, the whole afternoon. Um, and indeed, the entire provision on joinder in the Swiss rules is only a few lines long and is included in one subparagraph of the Swiss rules. And again, um, very much in contrast to many other uh, rules in other of other arbitral institutions, um, which often span over several pages, and that is not even including references uh, to other provisions on multi-party and multi-contract arbitration, which are also very often very long. I think um, the LCIA is probably um, the only provision I know in any of the most commonly used arbitration rules that will give the Swiss rules a run for its money when it comes to brevity of the provisions on joinder. And we might discuss um, later on um, whether brevity uh, is really the sole of it in this case. Now, let me say a few words on the main characteristics um, of the joinder provision, the Swiss rules. So we heard, and this is what Patricia says um, in her introduction, and rightly so, um, is I think one point of distinction between the rules in the case of the Swiss rules, it's the arbitral tribunal that decides on joinder. The rationale behind that is that although they are distinct issues, there is a connection very often between whether there should be a joinder and issues of jurisdiction, and the drafters of the Swiss rules felt that both issues should be decided um, by the same instance, which in this case is the arbitral tribunal. Also noteworthy is the fact that there is no time restriction under the Swiss rules, but that is, of course, an element that will be taken into account by the arbitral tribunal when deciding on whether or not there should be a joinder. Noteworthy also, because it is um, something that is quite distinct to the Swiss rules, is that it allows for the joining of third persons by a party to the arbitration or it also allows for the request of a third person to join a pending arbitration, which is sometimes also referred to intervention as opposed to joined in the stricter sense. Fourth, it allows for joined of third persons as actual parties to the arbitration. So someone who brings a claim or against whom a claim is brought but it also allows for joinder in a broader sense of a party in another capacity. Um, so as an accessory party, so to speak, to the arbitration. There's different concepts under different civil law and common laws, such as side intervention, which may be known to many of the civil lawyers um, on the webinar today, uh, third party practice in the US, uh, vouching in, and even amicus curia it can be used as a basis to allow for amicus curia in, in uh, Swiss rules proceedings. When it comes to the criteria for joinder, um, you will have noticed that Article 4.2 uh, actually gives you none. 
Um, it leaves for very broad discretion of the arbitral tribunal and therefore also broad flexibility, which is very much in line with the concept of the Swiss rules in general. Um, flexibility um, stands above all. Now, I don't have time to go into the whole debate as to uh, whether there is a need for some form of consent um, of both the party to be joined to the arbitration, but also of the other party. So not the party requesting joinder, but the other party. Um, that is something where there is debate, uh, different positions can be taken. And I believe those of you dealing with the meet will have looked at the uh, arguments um, for and against that position in quite some detail. As Patricia said in her introduction, uh, joinder and the formal requirements for joinder and jurisdiction are two different things. Um, I think the most commonly represented view is that Article 4.2 does not create a jurisdictional basis. However, there are also views to the contrary, and it could be argued that there is some kind um, of anticipated uh, agreement also with regard, not only with regard to joinder, but also with regard to jurisdiction. And the final point of my very brief introduction uh, concerns the composition of the arbitral tribunal. In a situation where joinder is decided by the arbitral tribunal that has already been constituted, there will of course always be concerns as to the non-participation of the party to be joined in the composition of the arbitral tribunal. The Swiss rules give little guidance on that. Again, it's all about flexibility. Um, in case of an intervention where a party requests to be joined to an already ongoing arbitration, that will arguably not be a big issue, at least in most cases, uh, where the third person or the third party agrees to the already existent arbitral tribunal, it will obviously also not be an issue. Where it becomes thorny is where the third party may agree to join her but does not agree to the composition of the arbitral tribunal. Again, it will be looked at on a case by case basis. Um, generally speaking, there will be no joinder where the third party does not agree to the composition of the tribunal, unless possibly it would not have had a say in the constitution of the tribunal in any event, because the arbitrators were, for instance, appointed by the court. Um, but the Swiss rules do also allow in exceptional circumstances for the reconstitution of the arbitral tribunal if the third party doesn't agree. Um, but that is a matter of practice and not a matter of an express rule in the Swiss rules. So I think I'll leave it at that for now, um, and we can maybe pick up one or two points in the discussion afterwards. So um, may I invite uh, Shirlene and Benno to make some comments on that? Um, perhaps, uh, Shirlene, if you were to compare that to the approach of the Hong Kong rules, sorry, formerly you worked with the ICC, um, what do you think? Do you, do you prefer the institution to make the decision or do you think it's better that it's at the tribunal? Um, I have to be honest, sometimes it, it really kind of depends on the situation. So Patricia, as you alluded, alluded to earlier, the ICC in 2021, 1 January will amend its um, ICC arbitration rules and Article 7 this time will now provide for a situation where the arbitral tribunal can take the decision on a request for joinder if such request was made after the tribunal was constituted. Now, prior to this, in 2012, when the ICC first formalized or expressly included the option of joinder in its ICC rules, it was only for the ICC court to take the decision, even if the request for joinder was received after the tribunal was constituted. The HKIC um, in 2012 sorry, in 2000, in, yeah, 2012 also incorporated the option of joinder um, in their rules effective 2012. Prior to that, they had a practice, but never had it actually included. And what the HKIC did was they allowed both the HKIC secretariat to take the decision if the request was made before the tribunal was constituted and for the tribunal to take the decision after the tribunal was constituted. Now. Whilst I was at the ICC, I have to be honest, I think most of the cases that were a situation, the request for joinder came after the tribunal was constituted, um, the majority of the parties expected the tribunal to take the decision. 
but that actually never happened under the 2012 or even the 2017 rules because of the rules uh, expressly stated it needed to be a decision by the ICC court. Um, but even in practice, the ICC court really only takes the decision when they look at it from prima, prima facie standard. And almost always, I would say probably 75 to 80% of the time, the question was ultimately pushed to the tribunal to then take the substantive decision of whether or not they had jurisdiction over this additional party. Um, Benno, can you tell us, are you familiar with the, I guess, the ICDR practice? Do you think it's um, better that the dis discretion is dis made by the tribunal or by the institution? And under the ICDR rules, where is that discretion and the final decision made? Um, Patricia, what I was going to say is I think it's really a false choice. Mm -hmm. Because if the rules provide that there's an administrative decision by the institution, it's only an administrative decision. And if, you, if you're opposing the joinder, then you're going to challenge juris, ju, jurisdiction before the tribunal in any event. And in fact, you have to do that because if you don't do it, you won't preserve it when it comes time to either set aside the award or to, or to, or to oppose enforcement. So I, I really think the administrative decision becomes in a sense uh, a, a, a step, but it's not determinative of anything. And uh, ultimately, one has to challenge it before the tribunal if one wants to preserve that issue. So, so I think there are differences in the rules, but I think net-net, it doesn't matter in terms of how one practices arbitration before the respective tribunals. But, but I, I think we'll come back to this later. It, you know, I, I, I'm a strong believer in party consent um, with respect to, the cons to, to arbitration generally. I find it difficult to put rules in, a, in an arbitration clause where I have no idea um, what the basis is going to be that either the institution or the tribunal uses with respect to making a decision as important as joinder. And it really is a very important decision. So I think this is a, a, a topic we'll come back to um, as we continue our conversation. Um, Chris, um, can you tell us the Swiss rules are now being subject to revision. Can you share with us if there's anything in the joinder rule, which in practice has maybe had some uh, bumps along the road that might result in revision in the future? I'm afraid the only thing I can share with you that I can't is that I can't share anything with you. Um, the, the rules, as you say, are, on de, are, are still undergoing revision and it is as of yet unclear whether there will be any changes and if so, what those changes are going to be. And, you know, I think the discussions we're having, and I can say this much, uh, goes very much to what Benno just said, whether there needs to be more what is maybe perceived as legal certainty because there is more guidance in the rules or whether at the end of the day in practice, it is not beneficial to the parties to have a provision that gives as much flexibility as possible because there are so many different scenarios that may fall under the very broad term of joinder that by trying to define rules you know, in too much detail might actually not work in each case in practice. Well, I guess the, the, the $60 question, not the $200 question, um, if, if, when you're sitting as an arbitrator, could you identify one or two factors which you think tend to be the most decisive when deciding whether or not to allow a joinder? Is that to question to me or to, to all of us? Not to you, to you, Chris. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, again, it depends under which rules I, I sit, of course, and, and there will be different guidance under different rules. If I sit under Swiss rules, what will be very important is, of course, from a procedural standpoint, that if there is more than one, arbit well, first of all, I will look at, is there more than one arbitration agreement? Or are we talking about a multi- uh, party contract where all of the parties, including the party to be joined, um, you know, would be under the umbrella of the same arbitration agreement. Where it becomes tricky is if you have a multi-party and multi-contract scenario. Um, that is where you have to look at whether the arbitration agreements that are different are compatible from a procedural point of view. And then I think 
you know, what will always guide me is, uh, is procedural efficiency. And that is something that can go both ways. It can be very efficient to hear two disputes, for instance, that relate to the same project in one arbitration. But it can be very inefficient to include a third party to an already ongoing arbitration. Um, and then I personally would obviously always look to consent because as Benno said, the most important thing in arbitration is consent. Now you can discuss whether implied consent is sufficient. Uh, you can discuss whether agreeing to a set of rules that allows for very broad joinder is sufficient implied consent. Uh, but in my view, there always needs to be some form of consent. Without consent, just like without consent, there is no arbitration. Without consent, there is no joinder or there should be no joinder. Erlene, can you take us to the to the Asian view, or, or the, isn't the general sense of the importance of consent as embedded into the approach in in Asia, or is that just too broad of a generalization? Um, I think with respect to the institutions, particularly the leading institutions in Asia, consent is also. I mean, consent is the cornerstone of arbitration, which. I remember quoting as a Moody 10 years ago, and I'm still quoting today in, uh, in submissions or to students, but that is the core of arbitration and you see it in the rules um, in the leading institutions here in Asia. Uh, we already mentioned the ICC does expressly incorporate joinder provisions as does the HKIC. Um, sorry, ICC, no need to elaborate, but HKIC Hong Kong. We've got the SIAC in Singapore that also has an express joinder provision as does CTAC up in China. Um, one interesting thing that actually Chris, you raised and I didn't really look at it from that perspective is whether or not a non-party could try to join itself into the arbitration. And looking at these institutions, the only institution that is possible here in Asia and I'm happy to be corrected is actually the SIAC. Um, the express provisions in the rules in the ICC, HKIC, and CTAC, whilst significantly longer than the Swiss rules, do expressly provide that a request for joinder has to come from a party, which would mean that it is a party in the arbitration. But when it comes to the idea of whether or not joinder exists, it does here in Asia, and it is quite common given the types of transactions or the cross-border transactions that occur involving Asian parties. Um, for example, IP transactions or other transactions, commercial transactions, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, et cetera. There, there's always a, a subcontractor or another party that's involved in the overall uh, business transaction that when a dispute arises, you may not have necessarily noticed and therefore the dispute is initiated against a party uh, one of the parties that is not, or one of the parties that is actually the party to the agreement and as you get further into the dispute or as you start to go get a bit better or clearer picture of the dispute, you realize that there are other alleged non-parties to the agreement that are involved in the transaction and are necessary to be a part of such arbitration in your view. But I think that would be the stance basically in Asia for now. In, in your experience, Shirley, what, what do you think are the practical reasons that a party may resist joinder, legitimate practical reasons. It's not to delaying, it's not trying to uh, obstruct the arbitration. Um, well, I actually had an interesting case that happened where the parties there, basically the party that was actually involved in the arbitration was a, not necessarily a, a subsidiary, an affiliate, which without a direct connection to the parent companies, and the business transaction was specifically constructed so that this party would be the actual signatory to the contract and bear all of the liabilities. Now, when the claimant um, came in and tried to collect or initiate a dispute, it realized that such party happened to actually be a shell company. And so it tried to bring in about 11 other affiliates of this shell company. And I mean, these 11 companies had a legitimate reason why they did not want to be joined. They, they may have taken part in the transaction, but in a specific role where all parties involved were aware that they were not actual parties to the, to the contract itself. Um, the way that international businesses 
structure themselves is that they currently structure themselves so that they have protections. Um, they will have certain companies enter into certain agreements so that the liability stays there. But if you have an international group of companies, it's quite common to see that a parent company or an affiliate company in another country or with more um, capital will take a certain role, but not necessarily the role where they would need to bear the liability in the situation when the dispute arises. There is a question in the Q&A that someone has asked, and maybe it's a bit related to what you're talking about, Charlene, and that is that someone has asked if, if there's any criteria to make a distinction between a formal party who should be joined and an accessory party. I, I think, quite honestly speaking for me, an accessory party just to me would just not be an actual party to the arbitration proceeding. Perhaps this accessory party would be, for example, a witness um, or contribute, there would be evidence from this accessory party, but under these specific rules, let's just use the ICC, for example, unless they are specifically brought in to the arbitration as a party to the arbitration, then there, the only requirements that need to be met under the ICC is that there is a, basically jurisdiction over such party. In essence, that party has consented. If I could maybe just give a few practical examples. A very simple distinction. It's a party who is not making a claim or against whom no claim is made. So it's a party who has a specific interest in the outcome of the dispute. Um, I just had a hearing last week where we had seven interveners uh, in the hearing room. So those were parties that were not, was not under the Swiss rules, was under a different set of rules, but um, those are parties who have an, an actual interest in the outcome of the case. Um, they were allowed to make pleadings, they were allowed to present witnesses and experts, but they were making no claims and no claims uh, were, were made against them. And then there are different forms um, in different jurisdictions and under different laws that allow for people to intervene and to be brought into disputes uh, without being formal parties to the dispute. Um, no, let me, let me ask you, uh, do you think that this is all a matter of the rules or are these issues also concerning the underlying applicable law? Patricia, your, the question was to me? Yes. Um, what I was gonna say is I, uh, I, I, Chris's example of, of the case he just described, to me, doesn't sound like like any rules that I'm familiar with, uh, and it and and it it goes back to a very fundamental notion, and maybe I was taught arbitration too long ago, but the consent to arbitrate that parties enter into is not a consent to arbitrate generally, or or to the, or to arbitrate with the world or to arbitrate with anyone. It's to arbitrate with a particular party or parties who've signed an agreement and who've, and who've defined what they're going to arbitrate about. And, and I, think that's, I think that concept of consent is, is fundamental. Now, it, it, you know, it, and this is where having litigated in a national court is very important, I think, in terms of perspective. National courts handle this problem beautifully. Every national court that I know of has rules of procedure which allow you to join virtually anyone you want. They allow you to bring in additional parties for almost any reason you want. And there's no question that the court has jurisdiction or, or if it doesn't, it's quickly resolved. But that's a very funda that's a model fundamentally different than the arbitration model. And it's important to keep in mind that I think that, that before 2012, you could not find a joinder provision in any set of international arbitration rules. I mean, international arbitration has been trying hard to catch up with the national courts on this issue. And each institution has done it in a little bit different way. But the, the fundamental threat to the process is that whatever is done in the arbitration, that's not the final word on whether it was appropriate and it can cause far more inefficiency when you find that your award has been set aside or has not been enforced. Years after the arbitration began, years after the joinder took place, one can have an event that really calls into question, you know, the, the 
efficiency and the purpose of the of the initial joinder, which is why I think it's very important that the rules be quite specific about the criteria and the decision making be very disciplined because ultimately there is a national court that's going to is going to review the question. I can just add a sentence to what, what, what Ben said because I fully agree with him and I think especially when it comes to discipline um, you know that's where no matter what the rules say I think that's where arbitral tribunals or institutions for the reasons Ben said have to be very very careful to bring it back to my example the only reason the tribunal agreed to the intervention of those seven parties is because all of the parties agreed to it. I highly doubt that they would have ordered it had any one of the actual parties to the arbitration not agreed in writing um, to the joinder of those seven interveners. And that is very, very important. In, in the Q&A, someone has asked what happens if the joint party has not objected to jurisdiction, but one of the original parties considers that there is no jurisdiction, do they have standing to object to the jurisdiction either during the proceedings or in a subsequent enforcement action? Uh, uh, Patricia, what, what I would say is, uh, I mean, it would be very unusual for the third party who is being brought in not to object. But, but taking the hypothetical, I, I believe a party to the original arbitration can object because that party has not agreed to arbitrate with the third party. And in fact, it must object before the tribunal because if it doesn't, it will be deemed to have waived the, the jurisdictional objection. So, so I think there, there are, th this issue impacts everyone who is a party to the arbitration, whether they want the joinder or whether they don't, it impacts the entire process and it impacts the tribunal. And it seems that as we're um, looking at this tension between the consent issue, what did the parties agree to at the time of the conclusion of the contract or, or now, versus procedural efficiency as perceived by the tribunal and the parties who are, who are arguing for this. And as Benno points out, there could be issues if it's a jurisdictional analysis for a court who could review jurisdiction de novo. If the issue is strictly procedural efficiency, could it come down to an issue that this was a procedural error because I did not expressly agree to arbitrating with these parties and that any delegated or presumed does not apply because I objected to it? Or if you pass through the needle of jurisdiction, is is it now threaded and you cannot make a procedural argument on enforcement or on set aside? I think just coming to a really simple point and um, Chris and Benno, please correct me if I'm looking at it from a different perspective, but the idea of joinder isn't necessarily jurisdiction. As, as it was pointed out in the beginning, you have this procedural aspect where you have to follow the specific rules that guide your arbitration and if you're trying to join a party, the very first step is to file this request for joinder. Now, in this respect, if you go to the, um, if this, re this request for joinder was filed before the tribunal was even constituted, the court or secretariat, depending on what rules you're under, takes a decision based on a prima facie decision, right? It's not a decision on jurisdiction, it's just a decision on whether there's evidence that this third party should be joined could be bound by the arbitration agreement in question. Only when it gets to the tribunal does a party or do the parties then take a step with uh, on the arguments of jurisdiction. Yeah, I, I agree with, with that, Shirlin. I mean, I, what I see in practice is challenges in, you know, joinder scenarios usually relate to the question of jurisdiction. So it's not really the joiner decision per se. It's either lack of jurisdiction or it is improper composition of the arbitral tribunal because the third party didn't have a say. I think where institutions, but so, sometimes also arbitral tribunals get it wrong is on efficiency though, because they have a wrong definition of efficiency. Efficiency, as, as Benno indicated before, is broader than 
the arbitration procedure in the stricter sense. And I think sometimes they don't think beyond that. They don't really think enough about, you know, what does this join to mean in terms of setting aside, in terms of lack of enforcement? Uh, and, and also, you know, what does it mean? They don't balance the interests of efficiency enough. They look at efficiency from the side of either themselves um, or for their statistics or um, efficiency from the side of one party without balancing the perceived efficiencies of both parties enough. Yeah, now one of the um, uh, questions, we've had lots of questions. We've got some great questions. I'm impressed with our participants' questions. One of the questions is how important should confidentiality be? If you're in a, in a case that involves a lot of confidential intellectual property or, or trade secrets and whatever, how important Benno, should that determination be for the tribunal when making exercising its discretion? Well, I guess, I guess I would answer the, the question this way. For, for many parties, um, rightly or wrongly, the decision about going to arbitration, putting in an arbitration clause, is largely driven by the importance of confidentiality and lack of public viewing of the proceeding and of its result to the parties. And so those who enter into the arbitration often think it's a very important aspect of their transaction. Um, and, and so if, if that's true, and that's either reflected in the arbitration clause itself, and sometimes the arbitration clause is quite specific about this, or, and or it's reflected in the arbitration rules that are selected, then, then it seems to me that, that if there's a question about joinder, it has to be the case that, that the result of the joinder, if there is to be one, will be that the third party is subject to the same confidentiality regime that the original parties are subject to. And in fact, if, if the third party is really bound by the agreement to arbitrate, then, then it should be, it, that shouldn't even be a question because if they're bound to arbitrate, then they will clearly be bound by the same confidentiality provisions and also by the rules that should provide for it. And in most cases that I'm familiar with, the parties quickly into the case will one of the first things they submit to the tribunal is a proposed confidentiality order to handle all aspects of the case. And I would think that part of the joinder would be a requirement that that third party be subject to that as well. So I think I, I would expect that that's the least difficult aspect of the joinder to accomplish, because I think it's going to be in most cases the norm that there be confidentiality provisions that are effective and that are in place. And Maybe um, just to add one quick point, yes, I agree please. with that. Where it becomes difficult is where there are issues that are confidential between the two initial parties vis-a-vis -vis the third party, because then you can't just bind it in by a confidentiality agreement. And there is, for instance, under the Swiss rules, confidentiality and privacy is something that the tribunal will consider very closely in order to decide whether it's appropriate to, act, to order a joinder at all. It, it, we have two or three minutes before we're going to be passing over to the next hearing, to the next uh, panel. So in those two or three minutes, let me just raise one question um, in the, in the Q&A. Do you think when it comes to the constitution of the tribunal, if it's necessary to reconstitute or to consider that issue, um, does the decision become affected by whether the parties have appointed the original tribunal or if it's been the institution that has appointed the original tribunal? I, 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 would, I would say that, that if the parties have nominated arbitrators, um, and you try to bring in a third party who has not been able to participate in that process, you have the, the French Dutco problem, which I think is a serious problem because I think it's fundamental to the arbitral process that parties be, if their, con if their arbitration clause permits, they be given the, the right to participate in the selection of the tribunal. I think on the other hand, if for whatever reason, and it could be that the arbitration clause provides for institutional appointment. I think then that becomes essentially a non-issue because there would never have been a right 
that's being in any way infringed or compromised with respect to the, to the third party that's coming in. So I think it depends very much on the nature of their clause and the, and the, and the status of the arbitration at the time that joinder is, is sought. Mm -hmm. Sure. Really? Just, sorry, just jumping in on that, but, but some of the arbitral rules actually do uh, refer specifically to what happens if the tribunal has been constituted. Just jumping back to the ICC one in 2021, even though they've now allowed express requests for joinders following the constitution of the tribunal, it's actually stated that the decision would be made by the arbitral tribunal only if it's only subject to the additional party accepting the constitution of the tribunal. So I would assume if that additional party doesn't accept this, the nominated arbitrator, then the joinder would not even, or the request for joinder would not even be accepted. Whereas just a quick addition in the HKIC rules, however, um, there is a caveat that says that any constitution of the tribunal or any tribunal member that has been appointed may thereafter in essence not be appointed if a, an additional party is joined and that party basically objects to that nominated arbitrator. And uh, Shirlene, if it's an issue where if the joint party comes in, that there's going to be a conflict with one of the party appointed arbitrators, should that weigh into the decision of the joinder in a negative way? If the party does not object or if the party does not waive this conflict, I, I would say yes, because that would mean that they would have an objection to the arbitrator that's been appointed. And so that should the objection to the arbitrator should weigh heavier than the procedural efficiency of bringing them in? I think so. For me, one of the fundamental um, fundamental rights of a party in arbitration is to be able to choose its own arbitrator, or at least have a say in it. Mm -hmm. Well, we now have one minute left since we started a bit late. So let me um, offer Chris a parting, a parting comment. That's a tough one in one minute. Um, uh, maybe parting comments to all of those um, participating in the moot. Um, I hope you have a lot of fun. I hope you have a lot of fun with the Swiss rules. I am very much looking forward to hearing all of your arguments on the Swiss rules. And uh, we may just take into consideration your arguments in the revision of the rules. Great. And uh, Benno, would you have a parting comment before we hand over to our colleagues? I would say Chris's invitation that, that, that the arguments that are made in the competition now could, could be useful at the very least and maybe influential with respect to the rule process is really a, a remarkable opportunity for the participants this year because there will be more arguments made and more time spent on thinking about the rules and how they work and what kinds of issues arise through the competition than through any other kind of process that you can imagine. So I think this is, I think this is just a wonderful, it'll be a wonderful experience for the participants. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a boon to the, to the Swiss rules that they'll have this, this uh, all, all this test data. And Shirlene, as the president of the um, VIS Moot Alumni Association, what do you think? Did the author come up with a good procedural issue this year? Still participating? Uh, no, the, the Stefan um, always comes up with very good, very good and well thought out problems. And this year joinder is actually quite interesting. It's a bit different than what we've had in the recent years. Um, but wearing my Moot Alumni Association president hat, I do have to take this opportunity, no matter how late it is, to remind all the participants, whether or not you are um, an academic, a student or a professional to please join the Moot Alumni Association, because this is how you can stay connected to everyone with respect to the VIS. Great. Thank you, Shirlene, for staying up. It's now about two o'clock in the morning for you, your usual bedtime, I'm sure. And thank you, Benno, for also joining us with your insightful comments. And Chris, I think you're going to be inundated with people trying to probably contact you after this webinar. As you can see from the questions, there's been lots of questions asking about um, things related to the Swiss rules and where to find more information. So um, maybe you better um, hire a special intern to monitor your email. So with that, Greta, we well, turn it over to you. And thank you so much, Chris, Benno, and Charlene. Oh, thanks, Patricia.
Well, thank you, uh, Patricia, and thank you to all the, the first panelists. This was a really, really interesting debate. And as Patricia said, I can tell from the, the Q&As, the, the participants found it very helpful as well. Um, but switching gears now to our second topic, and that is uh, virtual hearings in international arbitration. So, you know, it, virtual hearings is an interesting topic because it's been something that's been around and an option for us for a long time, but it really hasn't been used in any great um, degree uh, up until recently. And you know, now that we're faced with the, the COVID and the necessity of, of thinking about how to go about our, our lives uh, while dealing with this pandemic, it's really something that everyone's really gotten a crash course on uh, quickly and had to rethink how we approach it and what we think about virtual hearings for our cases. Um, but that being said, it's a complicated issue and there's, there's not a lot of answers to adapt to it in this uh, new world. Um, so to help us discuss about it and think about how we're handling these issues in uh, today's climate and virtual hearings, as uh, Rafael mentioned at the beginning, we have a great panel of uh, James Hosking, uh, my partner at, at Chaffetz Lindsay, who uh, sits as arbitrator and counsel. He's also heading up a, a project right now with ICA researching um, virtual hearings. And I believe there's a publication that should be coming out at some point, I'm not sure when, I'll, let, I'll, I'll leave that to him, to, uh, to diving into these issues more. We have uh, Fatma Balfaqui, who also sits as uh, arbitrator and counsel as well. And um, I know when we were scheduling the, the, the call for this to plan, uh, Fatma was, was uh, busy with her own virtual hearing. So I know she's bringing uh, firsthand experience uh, dealing with the realities and the practicalities uh, for these issues. And then uh, we have Rodrigo who's joining us from Sao Paulo, uh, who's a founder of his own law firm and is also uh, my pleasure to work with him on uh, the executive board for ICDR. Y and I, and I, I know Rodrigo has been involved with Avis over the years as well. So he's bringing a lot of practical experience um, from his background and his knowledge of, of all these issues as well. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop talking and uh, turn to James first. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's an issue that we're all grappling with, um, but what are we supposed to look, look for for answers? Where do, does the tribunal get their authority to, to order um, and, and manage uh, virtual hearings particularly when maybe not everyone's in agreement with, with what to do. Where, where should we go? Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, for the introduction, Greta, and thank you to the uh, ICDR YNI for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's particularly poignant for me because many years ago, I, I, I was one of the, the um, founding co-chairs of, of YNI back when I was uh, young and uh, and somewhat more international than I am during the current pandemic. Um, so I'm going to sort of set the scene with some introductory comments about the uh, where the tribunal finds its authority to order remote hearings uh, and talk a little bit about uh, how uh, arbitrators exercise their discretion. Um, this may be a topic of limited relevance if everyone agrees that a remote hearing is the is the right way to proceed. But absent that agreement, and I echo the words of, of the panelists that came before me as uh, consent being the cornerstone of arbitration, which is always a good phrase to have in your in your this brief somewhere. Um, uh, um, uh, in absent that agreement, uh, the tribunal has to look very carefully at, at those two topics. So it, it's good to go back to sort of the fundamental basics of uh, where the tribunals get their authority from. Um, and so I'll return to that image of the of the pyramid. Uh, the first place to look is, is the party's arbitration agreement. Uh, and there may well be language in the agreement that, that addresses the, the topic of remote hearings. It's unlikely, somewhat, somewhat unusual, but maybe becoming more prevalent these days. But there can also be phrases that the parties use to try and argue to the tribunal um, whether or not there is actually agreement on uh, whether there is a expectation of a physical in-person hearing versus a remote hearing. So there can be some tricky references. A reference to the seat or the place of arbitration, probably not enough. Does it make a difference if uh, the arbitration agreement says that the arbitration shall be held in New York City? You can argue that maybe that suggests the parties have turned their minds to a physical hearing. Or, or maybe there are unusual details in the party agreement, something like as one sees occasionally in the US, like the arbitration shall be conducted in accordance with the Federal Rules of Evidence or the CPLR in New York, something like that, which gives the parties arguments as to a more constrained uh, tribunal authority to order hearings. 
another sort of subset of uh, uh, places to look in terms of party agreement are prior procedural orders. Um, as we've all been adjusting to the, the challenges of working in the pandemic, um, procedural orders that may have been issued uh, prior to the pandemic, which anticipated a physical hearing, um, may suddenly have a new relevance as to arguably constraining the tribunal's authority. So uh, look at the full picture in terms of trying to find indicia of consent. Secondly, uh, of course, the institutional rules is a very important place to look. I'm not going to go into that in great detail. Um, uh, Rodrigo is going to talk about it uh, in his presentation, um, but clearly there, there are not only important, there's not only important to look at the rules, but also at the plethora of protocols, guidance notes, uh, and other um, um, uh, important papers that have come out from the institutions uh, since, the, um, since the pandemic started. And I should just plug the ICDR since we are at a YNI event, but do look at Article 23 of the ICDR rules, which one, one could say was um, prescient in, in giving the tribunal very broad authority uh, to order uh, hearings, uh, including um, uh, arguably also including remote hearings. The third uh, place to look is, is the Lex Arbitri, the law of the seat of arbitration. And really, this gives me a chance now to plug my ICA project, which Greta so nicely brought up. Uh, the ICA is producing in association with, with um, uh, two co-authors and I, uh, a, a project now looking at the right to a physical hearing. Does such a right exist in international arbitration? Uh, and we, as part of that, we are surveying 83 jurisdictions around the world where there are reporters reporting back on whether such a right exists and if so, um, how it, it can be applied. Um, so watch this space. There will be uh, a, um, uh, an announcement next month about some of the preliminary results and a publication of the paper in the first quarter of next year, which might be just in time for some event that's coming up um, in, in, in around the March timeframe. Um, uh, um, and as a teaser, I can tell you that uh, most jurisdictions are silent on the question of whether there's a right to a physical hearing and arbitration, but there is extensive case law on that right in the context of litigation. So it raises interesting topics about the extent to which that right should be applied in the arbitration world and, and think about whether that, um, uh, whether that should be applied, how that, how that could be applied in the arbitration world. Um, I mean, I can tell you that in, in the US, since that's where I am, I'll briefly mention it. Um, there is FAA case law, which basically is consistent with many other jurisdictions, provides a very broad discretion to arbitrators on issues such as how to hold a hearing. Um, and um, already there's been at least one case where that has been um, uh, you know, put to the test somewhat in the context of a preliminary injunction um, in a federal court case in Illinois. Um, and the last place, the, the sort of the, the, the last layer of the of the of the pyramid is the is the uh, questions around enforcement, New York Convention, um, uh, unstructured model law, whatever your um, appropriate uh, rubric is. And there, there are already um, you know the, the 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 main places to look are of course Article Five One B dealing with notice of the arbitration and the, and the right to present a uh, page right within its case, Article Five One D procedural irregularity and then public policy issues under Article 5.2. Um, my submission is that that very robust case law and, and many jurisdictions actually provides a pretty good formula for looking at uh, the questions of, of uh, enforceability of, of uh, remote hearing awards. Um, and, and I think Rodrigo is going to talk a little bit about uh, a case that's already come out of the Austrian Supreme Court, um, which touches on those issues, um, at least in the context of a challenge to an arbitrator. So the, the last thing I'll touch on is um, the discretion. Uh, what are the factors that go into exercising the discretion? Um, well, uh, once you've looked at those sources of authority, that may help answer your question. But I think you can also sort of come up with um, some core issues and subsidiary issues. The core issues, I'd say, are, is there party agreement? Um, again, the consent issue, which, which, which has already been discussed. Issues of delay and, efficient, and inefficiency, what happens if the remote hearing does not proceed or arguably does proceed. And I do think you should keep a, a broad mind there as to what uh, um, the, the topics that, um, that Benno raised. Uh, if there's a question about the enforceability of an award coming out of a remote hearing, then that's, that's a, an issue that should be considered under the efficiency heading. And then equality of arms and fairness. And that includes topics like access to into, into the IT so that there is a, a level playing field for access to the technology. Then there are subsidiary issues, security, confidentiality, health concerns, witness credibility, 
um, uh, the ability to present expert evidence and potentially language issues um, as well. And so the last thing I'll say is, um, where do you go to look for and exercising that discretion? Well, every case is different, but I, I do, for those who are Moochies and for those who are also considering these issues in practice, there is a wealth of information out there. Look to the institutions. They have some great uh, advice there and protocols. Um, I, I can plug the New York State Bar Association special issue from the summer this year, which pulled many of the, it has a bibliography in there of many of those, and you can find more online. Um, look to the due process, um, the, the, the increasing number of texts and commentaries on what does due process mean in the context of international arbitration. There's an excellent new book out um, edited by uh, Professor um, Franco Ferrari. Um, uh, and, and then think also about litigation guidelines that exist. Di a different forum, but a lot of learning there about how uh, discretion can be exercised in some of the practical issues that come up. There's some cases, for example, out of the Hong Kong High Court just in the last couple of weeks um, that analyze uh, applications for, to use VCF technology for, for remote hearings and litigation context. So um, there's some, some uh, introductory comments, and I know that my uh, co-panelists are gonna, you know, to uh, carry on with uh, some of those uh, in a moment. Thanks, James. One of the points I wanna pick up on that you, that you were just talking about is with respect to discretion of the tribunal and um, some of the different factors that will come to play with that. I'm wondering, uh, Fatma, if you've seen in your, your practice either as counsel or as arbitrator, how that, that exercise of discretion has been playing out uh, in light of the COVID situation. Are, are you seeing either yourself or, or parties uh, taking more consideration of the specific uncertainties um, of COVID, for example? So, you know, is there concern that we don't really know when this is ending? So we either go now with a virtual hearing or, you know, God knows when in person. Are those sort of things that are coming in, those kind of practical uh, realities and uncertainties, things that you're seeing being considered? Yeah, thank you, Greta, for the question. And of course, first of all, I would like to thank ICDR, uh, YNA, and uh, all my esteemed panelists and the attendees uh, for today's uh, invitation. Um, I, I would say that it's very highly unlikely for the parties willingly to try, for both of them to agree to delay everything. People usually go for arbitration because in theory, it's a faster method to kind of resolve their dispute. So unless there is a real um, uh, consideration whether uh, to the integrity of the arbitral proceeding or maybe even uh, consideration, cost consideration that it might be better for them to wait it out a little bit, I rarely see that somebody will actually intentionally put the break in uh, unless it's a party that's trying to prolong uh, <laughs> the situation uh, as, uh, as usually parties do. Um, but I would say there are solutions that are available and, and virtual hearings are a valid option given that the parties, both parties agree to it. So, uh, in, in, in short, the answer is I did not see it in practice that both parties will have said willingly, uh, let's wait and see, uh, let's wait this pandemic out. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we are also learning as a community uh, as we go. There's a lot of firsts that we're seeing within those last few months. So, uh, but I have not personally come across a situation like this. How about you, Rodrigo? Have you come across this situation? And, and maybe just picking up on something Fatma mentioned, we are seeing a lot of learning as we're going. And in particular, as, as James mentioned as well, the institutions are putting out certain guidelines and innovations, um, clarifications in their rules to, to deal with these issues. For example, I know the ICDR has put out guidelines on virtual hearings and, and um, draft protocols to deal with these issues. Um, I, I mean, how are you seeing these innovations and these adapt adaptations in real time uh, being helpful or, or, or not going far enough even uh, to deal with these issues. Thank you, Greta. Thank you, Patricia and Rafa uh, for putting this together. Thank you uh, also all the attendees that are being here with us. And uh, moving to back to your question, Greta, I see that those uh, new revisions, uh, guidelines, uh, they, they actually came to clarify new challenges posed by COVID uh, in particular, that the, the entire evidentiary hearing uh, may um, be conducted virtually, 
but it doesn't, as, as James uh, mentioned uh, beforehand, it doesn't mean that before COVID, the tribunal uh, did not have the authority or the discretion uh, to uh, manage hearings as it deems appropriate. So usually what I see is that the, the arbitration laws and arbitral institutional books, uh, they, they give those powers to the tribunal before and, uh, and after COVID. And, and however, the, the rules before COVID, they focus more on, on the examination of witnesses and experts by video conference, uh, but with other uh, participants in a physical room. Uh, so that, that, because that was the reality back then. A and uh, as mentioned, Article 23.5 uh, of the ICDR rules, that's also one of the revisions. And um, also the, the Article 25.4 of the Swiss rules, that the, the Vismuth rules. They, uh, they are, uh, the ICDR is, is back uh, from 2014, the, the Swiss rules 2012, but they, they do uh, give the power and authority to, to the tribunal. And, and now the new rules like the, the ICC, the LCIA, that they have already uh, published the, the rules and also the, the guidelines, uh, the, the major institutionals are uh, releasing guidelines. They all make clear that any hearing may be conducted entirely remotely. So I think that's the difference. The difference is in the, the reality that we have now. But, but uh, um, and the, the rules that came to clarify that, this new reality. So I think it's fair to say, Greta, that COVID gave a great push uh, towards the use of virtual hearings but the discretion and the authority was always there. Thank you. That, it's, a, it's a good point, Rodrigo, and I think that's, that's right. It's, we're slow to adapt to change and innovation in the legal community sometimes, but we, COVID made it necessary uh, to, to deal with this. You're, you're absolutely right. The, but talking about the practical aspects, um, you know, I, 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 I've had a, a few virtual hearings now and it's, it's starting to get easier. Uh, when you think about these things, but you know, the first one, there's all kinds of practical things that you don't uh, even know you need to think about first. And uh, that's, I think that's a, a challenge um, that a lot of us are, are facing in, in our cases, um, how to deal with, with all sorts of things, different time zones, different languages, uh, witness prep, expert prep, cross-examination, document sharing, all these sorts of things. So maybe I'll turn back to you, uh, Fatma, if you have any insight on, um, on how are these practical issues are, are playing out? Who's leading the charge with them? Um, how do you prepare? How are the parties reaching agreement or not reaching agreement? Yeah. Um, again, there is a, a big role for the uh, parties agreement and for the arbitrators as well to take the lead in, in trying to um, uh, iron out uh, some of the details. But there are some uh, practical considerations that uh, Every, all the parties within this uh, arbitral proceeding must be uh, must put into consideration. So uh, first of all, and, and one of uh, the things that maybe are considered as a uh, advantage for uh, opting for a virtual hearing is the um, arranging of the venue. We no longer have a, a traditional venue. Uh, parties are no longer uh, required to bear the cost uh, of, of the traditional venue, food and beverage, breakout rooms, and all of that. Uh, it have uh, been replaced by a, an initial investment, maybe by uh, law firms, by um, uh, arbitral uh, um, centers, to kind of invest into a, a, an appropriate software to allow for that virtual hearing to, to come in play. So first thing you have to choose the correct platform that you're going to use whether it's blue jeans microsoft teams zoom i'm not going to advocate for any or the other um they all work uh we've tried them all i think i have uh, every software that anybody can think of on my desktop <laughs> because it's the nature of work now um the next thing you have to consider are uh do the parties um, as you have mentioned before, do they want to kind of 
conduct all the procedural aspect of the hearing uh, by emails and delay a little bit uh, the, the actual hearing until they have uh, visibility on what, what's going on, especially uh, if uh, it's a little bit more on a national level. So if all the parties are in one country, maybe it's an option right now. Uh, versus a few months ago, it was not an option at all. Uh, so maybe that's that's something that they want to consider. But if it's an international business and, and international uh, arbitration and the way we see it, you know, some of the arbitrators, each one of them, similar to what we have now, are in different time zone and in a different place, then that is outside of the question uh, right now. And, and I will get to, back to the time zone consideration uh, later on. Uh, and then we really, as a council, I would really think long and hard about witness cross-examination and expert uh, cross-examination and the hot tubbing. Um, there is, uh, there are people of, the, the, I heard a few, a few uh, 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 arbitrators that are arguing that they don't even need to hear uh, witness uh, statements to be done physically or live or whatever it is, because they have everything in writing. And they don't need to uh, rehear the, the, um, the expert again, because they have everything in writing. So it made me think and pose, what is the purpose of having a, a, a cross-examination of the witness or the expert if the gravitas of the actual uh, uh, cross-examination is lost? You no longer can look an expert in the eye and challenging and challenge them, or you cannot look a, a, a witness in the eye and kind of have a feel of if they're truthful or not. So I would, I did not make up my mind yet because we are again we're just collecting experiences as as a community as a whole, but it is something to consider and it is something to kind of think twice with, if the arbitrator have arrived to a satisfying conclusion with the documents itself. And maybe it's something that, you know, I'm in a civil law jurisdiction. It's something that is uh, very uh, familiar for me you know, with all the civil lawsuits or commercial, we just exchange documents. We don't need uh, to have the, the drama of, of the cross-examination <laughs> per se. So maybe that's enough. So it's a consideration that might be good to think about a little bit. The other thing, and I don't know if uh, the rest of the panelists agree with that approach or not, and I'll be interested to hear their thoughts uh, actually about it. Um, now, we need to also uh, put in mind uh, uh, how ready the parties are uh, in adopting virtual hearings. Uh, it have been, and I think we'll, we're going to uh, um, touch base on, on that later. I have found that, you know, actual, uh, actual uh, seats of arbitration, uh, like the, the, the governing laws and the national laws are a bit more ready with technology, with, with uh, supporting uh, laws to um, uh, practice virtual uh, hearings more than arbitrators and you know, councils and uh, uh, parties in an arbitral proceeding. Um, uh, comparing a, a, a normal litigation, at least here in the UAE, uh, versus an arbitral proceedings, uh, their learning curve was very quick and they were able to adapt for a, a virtual hearing much faster than uh, the rest of us in, in the arbitration uh, proceeding. So uh, we have to kind of examine how ready are the councils and their teams are? Uh, are they ready with their e-bundles? Uh, do they uh, know if they want certain messages between them? Uh, did they hash all those information out in their uh, terms of reference or the protocols uh, prior to the hearing itself? Uh, the readiness of the arbitrators uh, themselves, uh, as you have mentioned, Greta, um, the legal profession is quite slow in adapting technology. 
um, a few months back, uh, we were sending bundles uh, and bundles of hard copy files <laughs> to arbitrators uh, internationally sometimes in order to prep them. So the learning curve of some arbitrators who are a little bit set on their ways uh, uh, to just reading the hard documents, moving them to e-bundles and how to refer back to them, that the readiness of the witnesses, as uh, James have uh, um, uh, kindly mentioned, um, are they prepped? Are they ready? Uh, do they have uh, uh, their chosen book to swear on? As simple as that. Sometimes that's a, an issue. Um, the arbitration centers, if it's a, um, an institutional arbitration, and even uh, it's a, a quite a, a bit of an issue if it's an ad hoc arbitration, then you have no soft law to kind of support you in the matter. And you have to kind of agree a guideline to go uh, to, to guide you through it as well. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we will, uh, I think Rodrigo is going to um, touch on, on the national laws as well, and we're going to speak about it. Now, the last bit that I want to speak about is that how the virtual hearings and how this pandemic have forced uh, uh, us to even think about uh, th or force the parties to think about how they're going to uh, appoint uh, or nominate their arbitrators. They have to take consideration of time zones uh, issues because uh, it might be uh, um, uh, uh, like Shirley, it's, it's the middle of the night and you know with me here in the UAE it does not work and you know with somebody in the US maybe it might work so the, the, the issues that comes with that, the connectivity issues, um, I have faced it out of nowhere, <laughs> my connection just decided to stop working in the middle of one hearing so are we ready with a backup plan? Um, uh, and also cybersecurity issues. Uh, not all softwares are created equal, uh, and uh, so is uh, uh, cybersecurity and, and uh, threats of, of um, uh, hacking and all of that. Uh, now, cybersecurity have been uh, a concern since before, and this is one of the reasons why people are a little bit apprehensive. Um, um, a year ago, for example, with, with moving completely into uh, the virtual world. Uh, I will stop there and uh, uh, we will come back and discuss a few, um, a few, uh, you know, items from what I've said later on. Well, I will just say as a, um, your, your comment on the cross-examination uh, stuck with me because as a common law and American lawyer, I love the drama of a cross-examination. So <laughs> to, to, to be worried about missing out on that virtually is something in my mind is counsel. Um, but I am curious, uh, maybe James turning to you for a moment. I am curious, um, I know you've sat as both counsel and arbitrator in virtual hearings since um, this all started in, in March or so. What are, and this is a few of the questions we've got in the chat. What are the types of um, challenges that you're seeing either from opposing counsel or for, from counsel as arbitrator that where they're either objecting to it or saying it's just, there's too many concerns, whether it's confidentiality, um, maybe they're concerned about how effective a cross can be. What are the sort of arguments and issues that parties are are claiming that you're seeing as a, a practical reality in your practice? Well, maybe just let me pick up on, on two, uh, which I think tie in with, with um, some of, of Fatima's comments. Um, so I, I have seen um, a common objection that it's the cross-examination point, that it's essential that the tribunal has an opportunity to assess this particular witness's credibility. Um, and that leads to the interesting question, you know, some would say you're in a better position to do it when you're staring at one of these little Zoom boxes that we spend all our lives looking at now, as opposed to the distraction of a, of a larger hearing room. Um, you know, and then in some cases that, that I have some sympathy for that position. Um, it is not as dramatic uh, as, as a sort of a US litigation style cross-examination because you have to be more um, precise because of the, the sort of the, the limitations of technology. Um, so balancing that issue is, is, I think, one of the hard things I've come across as both counsel and, and arbitrator. So that's, and I don't have a, a good answer, except I also, I think that will be addressed by technology over time. And also as counsel become more familiar with adjusting their, their advocacy styles. Um, and the second thing I'll pick up on is, um, is um, uh, cybersecurity. Um, I, I did have that in a, in a sovereign, in, 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 a, in an ISDS case where um, or it was an exit case where, where exit will only use one provider. 
um, at, for, for, for a platform for the hearing. Um, and there were special issues that came up about sensitivity of information. It was supposed to be a public hearing where, where you know, anyone could, could watch it being streamed. You'd think that'd be even easier in a remote hearing world, but because of um, confidentiality restrictions in the end, there had to be a delay on it. So those are just two issues that, that, that come up um, and that I think over time will be addressed by, by technology and by changes in advocacy style. Sorry, I couldn't unmute my myself for a second. Um, Rodrigo, maybe turning to, to you now to get your insight on it. It's been um, mentioned a couple of times now as to the issues that come up when you don't have party agreement. You know, it's one thing to say party agreement and you just need to work out the kinks as to how the, the virtual hearing will proceed. But what happens if one of the parties is not agreeing at all and is, is demanding an in-person hearing, either based on law, the arbitration agreement, the rules, some other factor? I mean, are there are there issues that we should keep in mind that could impact the enforceability and the of the award and the finality of the dispute? Yes, uh, certainly, Greta. I, I think that on this point, some arbitrary institutions are, are doing a good job of providing templates of procedural orders to make uh, everyone's life easier and especially the, the tribunal's life. So on these uh, templates, we have uh, ICDR. Uh, templates, ICC, CPR as well, and they all, uh, of them, they, they deal with this issue when there is no party agreement. And, and then uh, they, um, what they, what they say is uh, that the tribunal should uh, always keep and manage the case in a fair, expeditious, and cost-effective way. So, so that, that's the, uh, the, the big deal uh, that the, the arbitrator has to, to, to keep in mind. Now, when there is a, a party disagreement, uh, uh, in my opinion, the, the tribunal should, of course, consider these templates and, and use them. But in addition, uh, they also have, as uh, mentioned by James, uh, look at the arbitration clause, the arbitration institutional rules themselves. Also, the, the, the law of the seat, mandatory provisions uh, regarding uh, the conduct of the hearings, the presentation of the evidence, uh, as mentioned by Fatima once again, data protection. We uh, in Brazil, we just seen a couple of weeks ago, uh, the entering into force of the uh, new data protection law. So I think, and I would say that in addition, um, Look at the, of course, the justified refusal of that party. Why it's claiming that it should be in person. Maybe there is a good reason for that uh, or any damage that could be caused to any party if a virtual hearing is held. Now, uh, just to uh, give some thoughts as well about logistical time zones, time zones difference as mentioned by Fatima, technical uh, equal treatment concerns uh, so all that putting together, the, the arbitrator has to balance and, and see whether that will be postponed or not, and keeping in mind that the award uh, should be enforceable. So uh, if I may, I, I'm happy to address the, the, the Alstrom case uh, now or later on, with uh, I, I leave back to you. I'm uh, having a mute issue. The, this is a, a demonstration of technology issues. I was just saying, uh, Rodrigo, I, I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the Austrian case. If you want to proceed, I think that's great. Okay, that, that's, uh, I believe it's going to be one of the, the most cited case uh, during the VIS uh, mood competition, at least so far, because it, it, it goes uh, straight to this point that there was no, there was, uh, um, um, an arbitration going on in Vienna. The seat was in Vienna um, under the VIAC rules. So uh, the respondents did not agree to proceed with a virtual hearing. Now, the, the tribunal decided to, to, to move forward with the, uh, the virtual hearing. And um, the, the respondents challenged 
that decision. Challenge should first to the to VIAC and then to the Austrian Supreme Court. And bo they both rejected uh, respondents' argument. And, and in, in this specific case, uh, the, the, the grounds that were raised by the respondents were the following, that they were not given appropriate notice of the hearing, time zones, uh, time zone difference. That was the hearing took place at uh, 6 a.m. in California and 3 p.m. in Vienna. Uh, and that amounted to an unequal treatment of the parties. And that neither, and th this last point, I think goes towards what Fatma was saying, whether everyone is prepared to go live in, in a virtual hearing. So the, this la the last round was that neither the tribunal nor the parties were able to confirm whether there were other persons uh, in the room and whether uh, the witnesses uh, were uh, consulting some notes, documents, or even uh, looking at the, the WhatsApp, let's say. So uh, I think that's a, a recent and a great case because came by coincidence from Vienna to the Wismut. So I'm sure that uh, the, the Austrian Supreme Court will become very well known uh, from now on. Thank you. Sorry, well, this is now getting embarrassing, my, my mute issues. Um, with the few, is the few moments we have less, though, left, though, we're getting a, a handful of questions about a, a, a point that I think each of you have touched on in different um, capacities. And that's a, a, a concept you just mentioned, Rodrigo, which is equal treatment of the parties. Um, you know, I think this comes into play at each of the different kind of areas we, we thought about with discretion of the tribunal, the practical consequences, perhaps at the in, enforceability. Um, how does the tribunal balance this? How, how do they, they balance the right that, of a party to, to, um, to have the dispute resolved efficiently versus um, you know, making sure that, that everyone has sufficient or close to sufficient technology that are similar, that you know, maybe someone is up at 2 a.m. versus someone being able to make their argument at 3 p.m. Um, without giving any answers, obviously, uh, you know, what, how is this, uh, how are we resolving this? Is, are, is it, is it weighing in favor of efficiency or weighing in favor of total equality of arms, I think, to pick up on James's uh, term? Yeah, that, that's, uh, th that's a good question. And, and I think what it's clear, at least from these templates, uh, that before setting the hearing, the tribunal should first uh, uh, give uh, uh, proper notice in advance to the parties well, what, what that's considering to do it virtually and when and, and, and then keep in mind the time zones uh, difference and, and other housekeeping issues uh, uh, very well mentioned by, by Fatima uh, now during the hearing in order to try to mitigate challenge uh, as happening in, the, in that uh, Vienna case uh, act quickly to ratify an incident. So whether there are other persons in the room, uh, you can ask counsel, counsel, please, could you, or the, the witness, could you please turn around the camera or, or use a, three, a 360 degree view camera? Uh, or, or even uh, uh, could you put down the camera? I wanna see your hands as well. Um, so uh, if there is any incident that like, like these ones, uh, the, the tribunal should act quickly and, and also from time to time inquire counsel uh, whether the whether it's going smoothly, it's all well, safe and sound. So, uh, and lastly, I would say that I think that's the, the, the uh, one of the, the fundamental procedural principles in arbitration. Uh, always keep in mind, not just in the hearing, but uh, before and after that. The, the, the proceeding should be managed in a fair, expeditious, expeditious and cost-effective manner. Thank you. So it sounds like the, the answer is you have to be creative and think about how to address these concerns in, in new ways, uh, given the time. 
the times that we're in. Um, so with just a few minutes left, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn back to Fatma if you have uh, any closing remarks and thoughts on, on what Rodrigo's just shared and his views on um, in, enforceability and potential finality issues. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, first of all, I would just uh, like to add one point. I think uh, there are many uh, uh, very useful uh, resources for arbitrators and councils alike uh, with practical checklists for remote hearings that have been issued by uh, the Vienna Protocol, uh, by CR, by Seoul Protocol, uh, Delos as well. Um, I think the, the arbitrators and the councils should really take a very good look about the resources available to them um, and, and kind of uh, um, be more diligent in running uh, the, the, the procedures uh, of the arbitration. Now, going back to um, the, the uh, enforceability, uh, I would say that um, both the arbitrators and the uh, councils and the parties should really uh, take care about the applicable laws uh, in the seat of arbitration. Um, and they should review it first before deciding if uh, a virtual hearing is an option or not because there are some jurisdictions where they clearly in their laws mandate that there must be a physical hearing at least once. If I speak from experience, if this COVID situation happened before 2018, before the UAE have issued their federal laws uh, uh, for arbitration um, based on the model law uh, um, in, in August 2018, we would have been in that situation where the law itself would require the parties to be uh, physically available in one location. Uh, but luckily, <laughs> that is not the situation. Our lives would have been a complete and total uh, disaster. Um, so that is your first thing to check before you go ahead and, and decide if you need a, a virtual uh, hearing altogether or not. So it is very critical. And maybe uh, James, just a last word with you with the final um, one. One question that we just got that I, I thought might be interesting is if you want to take it up on on your your final word is whether virtual hearings really are more efficient. We, we're spending a lot of time on arbitrations anyway. Does a virtual hearing save us any time or money ultimately? Um, as a final word, I'll, I'll use two words. It depends. Um, <laughs> a good lawyer uh, answer. <laughs> um, yeah, really. I mean, it, it's just, um, I, I think um, it really does depend on the case. There are certain cost savings like travel and so on, but that tends to be the smaller part of a, of a large complex arbitration. Every case is different. And, and I think some aren't suited to virtual arbitrations and some are, and, and, and you just have to keep an open mind about it. And Rodrigo, I don't have a direction for you, but if you, if you, do you have a final word or final thought on, on whether virtual hearings are really helping us as much as we may think they are? I, I think they are helping us, not, not just in arbitration, but in the state courts as well. So if you, let's say for instance, in Brazil, the, the, the major institutions here, they are moving forward with the arbitration case and also the state court uh, in general are, they are promoting that the virtual hearings can, can take place. And, and the, the idea here is to always uh, move forward the case as expeditious as possible. So I think they are helping, but you all, sometimes you have uh, from the respondents, let's say, a case like in Vienna. Yeah, it's a fair point. Well, with that, we're we're at the end of our time. So I would just like to thank Fatma, Rodrigo, James. Thank you so much for this really interesting conversation. I, um, you know, we're all living virtual hearings, but I think this conversation shows there's a lot of questions and and um, innovations that are being made, which really make it perfect for a VIS problem. So, like Joinder, we hope maybe the the VIS problem will solve this and give us all some answers for our practices uh as well so thank you all for this really interesting discussion and to uh this deep dive into some of the the common problems we're all seeing in these issues thank you and uh this is rafael carmona once again i just want to conclude by thanking uh everyone uh once again for joining us and of course to the panelists this has been a very interesting conversation and i've uh, learned quite a few things i hope uh, that uh, you all the attendees have also learned and found it interesting 
And with that, I wish you all a great rest of your day. And I hope that uh, we'll see you in some of our future webinars. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.